Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, From Pixels to Patients. Today, we're going to talk about how simulation, video, analytics can aid in improving surgeon training and performance. My name is Orly Bogle, and I have the pleasure of being your host and moderator today. Before we get into the good stuff, there are a few disclaimers. First, this webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to participants. The touch surgery enterprise is not intended to direct surgery or aid in diagnosis or treatment of a disease or condition. Lastly, the opinions expressed by our guest speakers today are theirs alone and do not necessarily reflect those of Medtronic. We'd love for you to ask questions throughout the webinar. Uh, if you could please do so by finding the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. My colleague, Christine, will be monitoring questions throughout the webinar. We're going to kick things off by introducing our panelists who will then cover some key topics, such as providing an overview of the state of surgery today and how digital solutions can make an impact on training through simulation and surgical video. We'll then discuss how data and analytics can help support performance improvement. And finally, we'll finish off by taking questions from you, the audience. So let's meet our panelists. As I mentioned, my name is Orly Bogle, and I'm the Medical Affairs Director here at Digital Technologies Business Unit, which is part of the Surgical Operating Unit here at Medtronic. I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Daniel Smolin and Dr. Karen Kerr. Daniel is our Content Director and leads our creative studio that develop, develops and delivers content through the Touch Surgery app or immersive technology. And Dr. Karen Kerr leads our AI and analytics franchise that is focused on extracting additional value and insights from surgical video. Next, we are very honored to welcome Professor Bijan Patel, who will share his experience as an educator and why simulation is important for medical education and training. He'll also tell us why he uses the Touch Surgery app and its modules to teach novice surgeons. Next, we also have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Jason Lee, who is an assistant professor at Toronto General Hospital, which was the first site in Canada to use the touch surgery enterprise system in their operating room. Dr. Lee will give us his perspective on how he uses surgical video for post-case review, coaching, and mentorship opportunities. So, to put context into the discussion that we're having today, we're going to start by asking you, the audience, this question. How many hours a week do you think surgeons lose due to inefficient technology? You should see a Zoom poll pop up in the middle of your screen, and we'll give you a brief moment to answer. So before we get to the answer and how you've responded, let's level set to where we are today. So it's no secret that healthcare systems across the world are facing unprecedented challenges. We have aging global backlogs. Um, we have aging global populations. We've accumulated backlogs due to the global pandemic. And still with the boom in technology, many healthcare systems are antiquated and have not adopted digital solutions to meet their needs. Collectively, this is having a significant impact on efficiency and training in hospitals today. At Medtronic, we wanted to understand more and quantify the burden of outdated technology to surgeons. So we conducted a census-wide survey of 300 UK surgeons and asked them the same question that we asked you at the beginning of the webinar. For them, we asked them how many hours a week does it do you lose uh, due to inefficient technology? Kristen, if we can show the results of how the audience responded, please. Okay, well, majority of you 
guessed one to two hours. Well, it's worse than you think. Our research has actually shown that outdated technology costs UK surgeons up to four hours a week. So that's two full business days a month. We then asked surgeons, well, if they had that time back, what would they spend that time doing? Well, over half of UK surgeons said they would focus this time on either upskilling themselves or training their teams. We're lucky to have a surgeon from the UK on the panel today and a surgeon from Canada. So I'd like to pause and ask Professor Batal and, and Dr. Lee, does this data resonate with you and what you've experienced either in your own hospital today or a hospital that you've worked in in the past? Professor Batal, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Arlik, for uh, first of all inviting me to this webinar and uh, congratulations on capturing this data, uh, which uh, when I asked Chad GPT, uh, there was no response because there is no data. So congratulations on this. Now, we all don't function at the same level in terms of speed and efficiency, and it's widely recognized that improvement in technology and workflow optimization can help reduce inefficiencies in healthcare, including surgery. So the four hour, I mean, I, I can agree that into the four hours is about the time uh, we waste um, because of inefficient uh, technology, which is uh, a session a week. So, it, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite surprised that you got this figure right. Thank you, Professor Patel. And welcome, Dr. Lee. How about you in, in Canada? Do you see similar trends in, in your hospitals? Yeah, thanks again, Orly, for the invite. Sorry about the technical glitches there in the beginning, um, but uh, happy to make it on. But I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I think uh, in some cases it may be a bit of an underestimation depending on what you're doing that particular week. And, and um, you know, with technology being reliant on technology, when it works well, it's great. Uh, when you've got inefficiencies or things go down, it, it can really um, kind of mess up your entire sort of flow of the the. the uh, planned activities for the day can affect patient care. So um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, with what, what you discussed. Thank you both. That's really insightful. And it also echoes with what we're hearing from our customers, that this is a problem, not a UK problem, but it's one that's experienced globally. So what are we doing about it? At Medtronic, we are focused on building easy to use digital solutions that are designed to help maximize your time and provide you with insights into your performance so that your focus can be dedicated towards learning practices for yourselves or to others, as you said, Dr. Lee, in order to optimize patient care. Daniel, I wanna to pivot to you as the training and education content director can you tell us how simulation can also play an important role in solving some of these problems? Yes, sure. Thank you, Uli. Uh, when we refer to simulations, we're talking about the digital tools we develop to support the training and education journey of surgeons and surgical teams. Just a few of their benefits are that they help to scale medical education globally, and they help to maximize time spent at in-person training events with the use of pre-learning to build foundational knowledge and post-learning for retention and recall. They provide a unique learning experience for surgeons and their teams in anatomy training, procedural workflow training, device training, and scenario-based training or rehearsal. Um, I come from a healthcare background. Having trained and practiced as a podiatrist, I left clinical practice to work in visual effects and the film industry for about 15 years where I worked on films such as Iron Man and Harry Potter um, and James Bond. Now at Medtronic, together with a team of medical experts, creatives and engineers, we are evolving training and education. The training on touch surgery is accredited by the Royal College of Surgeons of England and has been validated through 25 independent academic studies and peer reviews, where studies show users scoring higher following learning on the app compared to those using more traditional methods like textbooks or PDFs. And so we developed four types of training and surgical video 
is crucial to our process and forms the foundation of all of our digitized training assets. We use sections of video uh, coupled with clever use of CGI, which is computer generated imagery, where we add learning points uh, to the existing video, um, as in the um, video on the left of the screen. These could be highlighted uh, or labeled critical anatomical, anatomical structures um, or parts of a device. Um, and then on the right, you can see some examples of where we reference video to create fully animated procedural training simulations, anatomy training, um, as well as our device training simulations. There is a lot of detail that goes into developing this training content and many people that contribute from our medical science liaison team supporting medical accuracy and the surgical storytelling, our quality team helping to maintain best-in-class training, and our subject matter expert and uh, KOL authors who share their experience and expertise to train others. And the creative and technical team who also come from backgrounds in film and TV, game development and medical visualization, um, who pay particular attention at the pixel level on the realism, visual quality, and interactive experience. And then we have our immersive VR training, as you see on the video uh, on the left, which is really useful for rehearsal to gain proficiency in those repetitive tasks that take up the surgical team's time and for, for, for uh, perfecting the use of a device like a surgical robot. Uh, this could be solo practice, or through co-presence, where it could be useful to join a peer, a proctor, or a training workshop in virtual reality. Um, and of course, we use annotated video for training surgical teams on the full workflow of any given procedure. Um, as you see in the video on the right of the screen, this is a tool which comes with several useful features to clip, annotate, and share video, including adding special surgeon tips, and then to benefit from the video analysis, which you'll hear more about in the next section. All of these digital training tools are an important asset in a surgical, uh, in a surgeon's training journey. Uh, not only are they slick, immersive, and beautifully presented, not only do they facilitate bite-sized chunks of learning on the go, in your pocket, with a mode for learning and a mode for testing or assessment, but they're also necessary to capture and analyze and individualize where you are in your training journey, where they need to pay more attention or where you need to um, get some additional support. Um, I'll now pass back to Orly, um, who has some practical questions on the subject for Professor Patel. Thanks so much, Daniel. Some key takeaways that I hear here is the ability to customize the training content to meet the learner at various stages of their career, and also removing the barrier of access and allowing them to learn and, and train anywhere, anytime. Professor Patel, I know that you've been using the Touch Surgery app for a while. I'd welcome your thoughts on the use of different types of simulation in medical education. How do you use this technology in your current practices? Thank you, Oli. Um, I feel more confident in the content quality of Touch Surgery app uh, now that it has been validated by uh, Royal College of Surgeons of England. However, uh, from my own personal experience, I can say that I've been using touch surgery even prior to this uh, validation by RCS England. And for me, uh, the two most important uh, elements of this uh, digital uh, education is, number one, it's free. Therefore, it's ideal global platform for scaling surgical education. And the second thing, uh, which is important for me, is it requires active user participation. Therefore, more concentration span, less distraction, which uh, I believe translates into a high impact uh, learning and better knowledge retention with shorter learning curves. Therefore, you know, you save time, which are the sort of obvious benefits of this. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, globalization and uh, democratization of uh, surgery. However, uh, high cost, Long duration of surgical training means we cannot scale surgical education to keep up and meet the demands. We've seen WHO data and targets on global workforce deficit. We've seen the Lancet Commission report on global surgery. These targets are 
not achievable. And just like our global zero emission target, all this remains work in progress and a good aspiration. Now, technology enhanced learning and simulation can fast track uh, training, surgical training. And if you look at uh, the literature, almost every published uh, paper uh, has shown that this and the impact on learning curve reduction from training by simulation. So I see uh, a simulation and in particular touch surgery as a Netflix of surgery or a digital textbook of surgery where you've got catalog of uh, surgical procedures you can rehearse and practice in your own time. And I see this as a, a high impact exercise, a bit like running marathon versus textbook reading, which I see it as just simply taking a walk in the park. Now, I like to sort of refer to touch surgery as my daily dose of uh, vitamin or an exercise regime for boosting cognitive skills and improve knowledge retention, which is what I tell my students. Because it not only helps build your cognitive skill, but retain knowledge and minimize the de-skilling because it's so easy and immersive and interactive to use. Uh, it facilitates, touch surgery facilitates self-directed learning and deliberate practice. It's immersive and interactive. These features allow group participation. Therefore, it can be used by anyone at any skill level. I, mean, I use it across the medical students, junior trainees, novices, and experts. And let me give you some examples. For novice and uh, junior trainees, I use it for as a pre-class uh, preparation um, and in-class group discussion. And following this post-class, we use the app for uh, assessment, including revision and retraining if required. With expert group, intermediate and expert group, I use it for group debates and interactive audience discussion in conferences and uh, small classrooms and tutorials, a moderate conference session with two or three panels, panelists, and go through a surgical procedure with audience active participation. It's a bit like surgical masterclass where you learn tips and tricks apart from uh, doing the procedure on touch surgery while sitting in the audience with your panel. And uh, this generates a lot of questions and queries and discussion and debates around surgical approaches uh, and uh, controversies, etc. I love that. I, I, I didn't know about the group debates. Professor Patel, I'd love to hear more about those stories. Um, so in your current teaching practices, you say that you use the touch surgery app across novices as well as experts. Do you see that touch surgery or even simulations in general, who, who do you think derives the most value from simulations? As I said, you know, I believe and I've seen the benefits across the spectrum. It doesn't matter whether you're a novice or uh, a training, but obviously the maximum benefit is during the early phase of your learning curve. So uh, it's extremely valuable when you are just on the steep part of your learning curve. And subsequent to that, it's about uh, uh, you know learning complex cases or something which is not common and you want to rehearse, use for that as an expert, whether it's mental rehearsal or with touch surgery, you do physical rehearsal before doing some rare case or a complex case, yeah. And, and how about the use of surgical video? Where does that fit in in your training practices as you train, you know, novices as well as expert surgeons? I love surgical videos and it's a shame that sort of I didn't have surgical videos uh, when I was a trainee. Uh, because we didn't have a high definition stacks and uh, devices to sort of record your performance. But we've seen video rehearsal in every industry. You know, any, any, any sort of motor skills where you require motor skills, it's an obvious advantage to just simply look at your performance, sit back after the match is finished, look at what, what went well and what can be done better. So I use surgical videos when trainees are, you know, when they first come into the simulation lab and they're practicing and they're just sort of struggling with simple tasks, pec transfer, pattern cutting, suturing and all. And those videos are priceless when you want to give feedback. So just sort of review and rehearse the videos. You can give them feedback on site, online, whatever you like. 
that's in relation to simulation training. With regards to surgery uh, and operative performance, I use videos to just simply reflect and look back what went well, especially when you have had complications. So uh, I think it is one of the most powerful tools to improve your practice and training. That's amazing. Thank you, Professor Patel. And I think that's a, a beautiful segue into to you, Dr. Lee. I know that you are a very strong supporter of using surgical video for training purposes. Could you tell us why you use surgical video and how has digital solutions like the Touch Surgery Enterprise solution help you save time? Thanks, Riley. Uh, I, I, for the longest time, since I've been in practice the last 15 years or so, I've always tried to record cases. Um, it's not an easy uh, process, as I'll talk about uh, in a few slides here, but um, you know, I think there's, as, as Professor Patel mentioned, there's educational value in reviewing and utilizing these surgical videos, but there's also, um, you know, feedback uh, and coaching opportunities that you can use to improve surgeon performance. So not just learning how to do the surgery, but how to optimize patient care outcomes, because ultimately at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do is improve patient outcomes. And so I think there's a sort of a you know, uh, uh, dual sort of focus on utilizing this video. And I think it's paramount. Um, and I must say, doing a lot of robotic surgery myself, that, that platform lends itself well to recording surgical videos. I think we still don't do a great job of recording open surgery, but, but, but obviously these minimally invasive platforms are really uh, optimal uh, situations for that kind of thing. Amazing, okay. So I'll hand it over to you, um, sure. Dr. Lee, to talk through some of your slides. Perfect. So, um, despite my uh, what my uh, my dad bot is saying, at one point I was a bit of an athlete when I was uh, younger. Um, I am joining the gym again to try to uh, get back into shape here. Um, but uh, you know, I always thought that surgeons, you know, were like athletes. Um, I never really got super far and never made any money playing any hockey or baseball, but. Um, you know, these elite athletes, they ultimately are similar to surgeons in that they often, uh, you know, perform in a team environment. Um, they have hours and hours of practice to get to that elite level performance. And ultimately, they, you know, can discuss and think about how they're going to do um, something, whatever it is, how they're going to perform that day. But ultimately, they have to go out onto the pitch, onto the field and perform. And that's very similar to a surgeon. You can plan how you're going to approach a case. Uh, what you know, a technique you may want to use, but ultimately, on the day of your surgery, you need to perform. And you know, as Dr. Patel and Professor Patel mentioned, I think using simulation or practice to get uh, to that level is is important. Um, but what athletes do that surgeons don't really do is, you know, reflect on how we uh, performed and using video, if you ask any elite athlete, they spend hours a day, obviously, pr uh, practicing on the pitch, but they also spend lots of time in the film room looking at how they performed. Um, and surgeons, we we don't often get a lot of feedback on how we did. Now, obviously, there's short-term feedback. You cut into an artery, it bleeds. Okay, you didn't do a good job there. That's immediate feedback. But a lot of the things we do, we don't get feedback right away for hours, days, weeks, months sometimes. You know, if you cut in the wrong spot and cause the positive margin, left some tumor behind, you may not get that pathology report back for, you know, weeks before you, you, you know, you, you noticed that you could have optimized the situation by taking a different technique. But by that time, you have no idea how, you know, how the case went. You don't recall what technique you used. So I think this is where video comes in handy and really allows, you know, surgeons to not just learn the surgery, but improve their technical skills, improve patient outcomes. So maybe we can switch to the next slide there early. And so, like I mentioned, you know, there's lots of benefits to using surgical video. Uh, surgical education is, I think, the most important uh, early on to the trainees. But, you know, it's amazing. Even experienced surgeons, uh, you know, I'm kind of mid-career. I've been at this for about 15 years. But uh, as uh, Professor Patel uh, alluded to, there are cases where I go back and look and say, well, you know what? The outcome on this particular patient wasn't optimal. This They had this complication or margins are positive. Then I can go back and look at the video and oftentimes I can actually reflect and say, oh, I know where, where I made the mistake. I should have cut here and there. And sort of, ref, you know, providing that reflection uh, is important. And I think that allows for skill improvement. And then as, as, as a program director, I'm constantly uh, sort of providing feedback to the residents. And I can describe the scenario, but 
you know, I think, you know, unless they look at the video and watch themselves doing it, 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 it doesn't really sink in as well. And so from a coaching perspective, post-operative de debrief perspective, I think it's very valuable. Next slide. Uh, the problem, like I alluded to earlier, has been access to this. You know, we would have to go through the 17, you know, uh, clicks to get a video recorded. Then we would have to get a USB, download it, and, that, and put it on my laptop. And then I got to go, you know, bring it up. And I have no idea where the in the video, it's a 45 gigabyte file. And I got to find where that, you know, the part that they were doing or I was doing is. It, it is very tedious, not efficient, wasted hours. And to be frank, most surgeons don't do it because we just don't have the time. You know, we don't have an hour to time to take each day to go over this kind of video. So up till now, it's been uh, as sort of too cumbersome to really utilize in real time. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I was so happy when, when I started to collaborate with Orly and our team and the Medtronic team um, to find out about all the advancements of the DS1 platform. And the DS1 platform is is sort of two two elements. It's got the actual brain, the DS1 computer, but it's also got a little um, handheld. It's like an iPhone kind of thing, uh, or an Android. I'm trying to be agnostic. Little handheld smartphone, um, and it's a controller controller device. And you can use both of these in the OR. Um, so while you're operating, especially for robotics, you're not scrubbed, so you can actually do this yourself. Um, you can record and pause, and you can annotate. Um, it also has AI algorithm built in uh, a, a program called Redactor that actually will blur, as you can see the little video there, blur any kind of faces that come into the video screen. If you pull your camera out, you obviously from a HIPAA perspective, you don't want nurses faces, patient faces or anything like that to show up on any of your videos. So it automatically blurs all of that out. Um, so it's a, it's a really uh, facile um, technology and platform that really allows this kind of video analysis, video uh, utilization for, for coaching and feedback to really be seamless. Um, and, and it makes you feel like you're part of a, you know, a, a elite sports team where you get all this easy access to, you know, primetime technology that can allow you to do this. So it's quite nice. And, and we've been using this for the last little while uh, for all of our robotics cases. We have both the um, Hugo and the uh, da Vinci platforms, and we've been using this. It's it's actually agnostic to platform. You can use it for robotics, laparoscopy, endoscopy. So it's it's quite a versatile platform. So we've been really happy to collaborate with Medtronic on this. Um, next slide. So there's just some pictures about how we use it. Orly came to visit us um, in the OR a few weeks ago, um, and it's quite easy to use. At the end of the day, surgeons do not want any kind of distractions. We like to get in our zone and sort of like many elite athletes, we like to get in our zone and do our thing. And so it's easy. It's literally a click of a button. Uh, it connects to the video feed coming from whatever procedure, procedure you're doing. Um, and, and this happened in, at the end of the case uh, as well. Like within minutes, I would say, seconds to minutes, the video of the procedure that I just performed shows up on my cloud. And it, uh, you, you download an app onto your uh, your smartphone. And literally, as I'm scrubbing out and walking out the door, I'm showing Orly, hey, look, this is the procedure I just did. And it's it's within minutes, seconds, it's right there. And so if I wanted to debrief with the, with the trainees, we literally can step out of the OR. And while the anesthesiologist is waking the patient up, we can literally go over the steps of the procedure we just performed. So it's no wasted you know, time. It's very efficient. Uh, uh, platform. And then within a short period of time, hours, days, you, 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 it also provides some analytical data, which is, again, a little talk to a, uh, a little bit about um, the advantages of that. But, you know, the uh, information that the surgeons are getting through this kind of platform are, we just haven't been able to access anything like that before. So it's really exciting. And I know, um, I think Karen will talk about uh, some other future directions as well, which I'm super excited about. Um, next slide. So in addition to that sort of real time, uh, you know, efficient post-performance review, which is important, um, you can also then, you know, share your videos uh, to your peers, to other experts. So a resident, for example, can push their video of a procedure they did with maybe Surgeon X, and they can send me the video and say, hey, Jason, can you, you know, look at my video and just comment on how I did on this particular part and give me some feedback. And I can go in 
and annotate any comments uh, on a procedure I did or vice versa. Someone may do a procedure with me and then want to send it to a surgeon Y and, and she can go in and give feedback to the resident as well. So it's quite nice to get sort of that um, delayed expert or peer feedback, which again is also very important um, on improving technical skills. Uh, next slide. Um, the the other thing that I've done some work on is the the like athletes, uh, the importance of warm up, and that and that can be technical skills warm up. So we've done some research looking at surgeons, you know, performing a little bit of the actual surgery they're going to do, and it actually improving their their uh, intraoperative performance, which makes sense. All this athletes they don't just walk onto the tennis court and just play; they they practice right ahead of time and warm up. And there's also research on cognitive warm up, and this is I think really important. Um, I don't know if the video is playing there, but you know we we often do a surgical timeout, um, not with the patient, but with more of an educational timeout with my residents. And I say, you know, um, Stephanie, you're going to be doing this part of the case uh, today. Let's focus on that. And in the past, I'd have to, with my waving of hands, describe like how that that should go, or mm -hmm. painstakingly pull out my laptop and try to figure out where that part of the case is and find that, which I. Or do just pop up my iPhone or Android, click on the case. And let's say they're doing tumor excision today. I could click on three, four videos within a few minutes and just show them that portion of the case, give them sort of tips and feedback on how to approach you know this particular tumor that we're going to resect using those videos as examples. And there's no other platform that, that I've been able to access to, to date that allows me to do this kind of seamless, uh, you know, preoperative cognitive warm up. Uh, next slide. The, the, the last thing that uh, maybe a, a segue to the next portion of the, of the webinar is data back. And uh, as mentioned, within a few hours, few days, um, you know, the, the, the AI algorithm for, for these procedures are able to splice up all the video and using uh, the AI technology, break it down into all the different components of the procedure, give you time estimates. And there's also other, you know, exciting um, uh, functionalities that will be coming down the pipeline with uh, touch surgery that will allow surgeons to really improve their performance. So right now we can look at, you know, the metrics of that last case and say, listen, hey, listen, for the Renora fee, uh, it took me double the time of my usual, you know, case average. Why is why was that? How you know how can I approve it? Was it just the case complexity or was it something that we're doing? And so we can use that kind of feedback. We can also look at you know, exciting opportunities like uh, performance scores. So the algorithm can actually give you a sort of a quantitative feedback on how you perform certain steps of the procedure. And I can go over that for myself, but also for my trainees and give them feedback. And when they're part of a, uh, you know, a robotics training curriculum, we can go over all this and use these metrics to, you know, you know, advance them to the next step and use that for proficiency uh, uh, testing. And uh, there's also administrative data uh, that the hospital use for this, you know, average length, you know, Jason doing partial nephrectomy or Stephanie doing prostatectomy. So they can start to plan and, and, and sort of, um, you know, uh, optimize OR theater or OR room uh, uh, allocations amongst the surgeons. So I think a lot of valuable information is coming down the pipeline with uh, with this kind of uh, platform technology. So really exciting. I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, next slide. I think that's all I, the main points I really wanted to to sort of highlight on how we use it um, locally. So really exciting stuff and um, very valuable for, for me and for my trainees. That's amazing, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. Um, it's interesting to hear that reviewing and watching your game tape is, is a practice that is consistently shown to improve performance, right? Whether that's in sports or the arts or now even in surgery. Um, I want to pivot to, to Karen. Karen, as the leader of the AI and analytics product offering, I'm wondering if you could shed some light into what Medtronic is doing to help extract these insights that Dr. Lee was talking about from surgical video and maybe give us a sneak peek into what we can expect to see in the future. Sure thing. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks, Orly, and Dr. Lee and Prof Patel for your excellent insights so far. So I think 
Dr. Lee did a fantastic job there of describing TSE and how easy it is to you record and review the surgical video. So as Orly said, I want to talk a bit about what we're going to do, what we can do with the surgical video and the information that we give back to surgeons both today and in the future. So as, as Dr. Lee also said, it's really hard to get that quantitative, the quantitative insights to look at those inefficiencies and to identify improvements in surgery. And this is where our TSE platform comes in. Um, we can provide insights to drive improvements based on trusted data, and we're developing the smarts for surgical video. And you can see here both our web and mobile views that we have of our, our performance insights. So we extract information in the form of timestamp data so that surgeons and their teams can review these timestamps and navigate easily in their surgical video in their online library. Um, both through our web and mobile views. And this actually provides information and data from their surgical videos that their teams would not normally have access to. And as, as, as Dr. Lee has said, we're using AI to do this more efficiently through, through automation. Our technology is able to automatically partition surgical procedures into semantic segments, and in this case, surgical, surgical phases. And these can be used and compared against the surgeon's previous cases. On a case-by-case -case basis, surgeons can now start to understand different patterns, the order of phases, the combinations of the surgical sequences that occur during their procedures. We're also able to show and highlight cases where significant variations occur with respect to previous cases. And also on the platform, as well as on the DS1 controller, individual cases can be tagged with information such as complications or different observations that happen during the case. And that can quickly help surgeons and their teams navigate and identify reasons for these outliers. On the, you can see here, we've got our, I think the view that Dr. Patel, Dr. Ellie, sorry, showed, showed our, our current view. And um, we're going to be releasing new, new views of our, on our mobile and web platform soon. We're always working to iterate and improve the UI um, for surgeons to meet their needs. But in addition to the phase analytics, we're really excited to be offering new data and analytics post-operatively on anatomy and instruments in view, which along with the video and the phase data is going to allow different views and insights that they'll be, the teams will be able to use and hopefully will be able to help drive conversations around efficiencies for surgeons and their teams. And we know that surgeons have told us that these analytical and measurable feedbacks can actually vastly improve surgical efficiency. They can help with surgeons review their performance, making sure that they perform to the highest of their abilities to reach that athletic level that, that we've alluded to. And this should hopefully, as we all want to do, improve patient outcomes. Maybe move on to the next slide, please, Orly. And here wanted to just really give a bit of a snippet and an insight into into what's to come and what's going on under the hood um, here at Medtronic. We're fully committed to building a, a, an ecosystem of digital solutions and this is going to help streamline the way in which information is connected between our devices, our surgeons, patients, looking at this from a pre, intra and post-operative perspective. And a key part of our digital ecosystem that we're building is, obviously, is our underpinning capabilities that we have in AI. So this slide here shows some of our four, the four building blocks for our AI development. We're building systems that are really going to be capable of understanding surgical procedures that will not only enhance our current analytic offering that, we, that we, I referenced in the previous slide, but they're gonna be a crucial part of our future potential product lines for intraoperative support. We've shown already with performance insights, how we can use surgical workflow analysis. What we're really doing with that is we're building up knowledge and that understanding and that intricate understanding of surgical procedures. And that's going to enable contextual understanding at any point of the surgery at any given time. Going forward, that's going to really help us to kind of enable other algorithms to be able to find information at the right time back to the surgeon intraoperatively. In the next, the next circle, you can see that we're looking at instrument detection and tracking. There's lots of different ways that this can be, can be done and detected over a surgical procedure. This slide shows a basic representation with our bounding boxes, and it's really demonstrating that we're able to correctly identify, classify, and localize surgical instruments and track their location across the, the short sequences. With this, in, with this data, both post-operatively and interoperatively, we're going to be able to look at instrument usage analytics. 
We're going to be able to understand surgeons' mov movements, their economies of motion, which are all going to feed into areas such as benchmarking, competency, and skill assessment in the future. And finally, with our, the, the, la the final two are really looking at kind of strat critical structure identification. We're building this out across a number of procedures and specialties, lap and robotic. Um, we're looking, to, we're going to be providing information to identify specific anatomical landmarks that are critical for the success of the operation. In the example at the end, in the fourth circle, you'll see a lap coli, which is highlighting the cystic duct and the cystic artery, which as you will all know, better than me, the surgeons, surgeons on the line, that the correct dissection and identification of these structures before clipping is key. So this helps us with the identification of these structures, will help lead towards the identification of the critical view of safety, which is an important safety check during the procedure. Um, so that's just a little bit of insights as to what we're, what we're doing, what's to come in the future. And we're really excited to be working with surgeons such as Prof Patel and Dr. Lee on the line as we develop our real-time applications for a roadmap. And I look forward to hearing um, further thoughts from them. And I will hand back to Orly now. So thank you. That's amazing, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, as you all can see, the future looks very bright and full of endless uh, possibilities. Uh, before we take some questions from the audience, I'd like to ask Dr. Lee and Professor Patel to take a moment and, and dream big. Um, what problems do you feel still needs addressing in surgical education? And where do you think digital solutions like simulation, like AI, could possibly be the answer? I don't know who wants to start. Who has some ideas? Maybe I'll start, Professor Patel, if that's okay. And, um, yeah. you know, I think uh, the, the exciting things that are coming down the pipeline with these platforms is, is, is making surgeons better surgeons. I think laparoscopy obviously minimized uh, the impact of surgery on patients uh, and, and and as did robotics and the advent of robotic platforms. And they're sort of really blossoming now across the globe. Um, and, and they do improve surgeon performance to a certain degree. Um, but there hasn't been a technology that really makes a surgeon truly better. Um, you know, it's almost like... Um, you know, uh, Tom Cruise in, the, in that movie, something tomorrow where you're wearing like a mechano suit. So you, you can get certain things that enha are enhanced, but it doesn't necessarily make you that much better. But what, we're, what we ultimately want is something like Iron Man. So while he's flying, there's data being shown on his in his mask that tells him, you know, how to optimally fly or where the danger is where or where not to go or what you know this kind of information and i think that's the most exciting thing for me uh, as a surgeon with this kind of new technology is that it's not just a, another robotics platform or whatnot it's but it's while i'm operating can you give me the data that will help me perform surgery better uh, not just a better tool but actually perform better and i think that's really exciting from an educational perspective obviously as Professor Patel mentioned, I think, you know, we have the, uh, you know, luxury of standing on the shoulders of giants. And they, we, you know, I grew up when video videos were starting to become available online so I could watch a case and start to learn, you know, uh, how to uh, approach a whatever case, a partial nephrectomy. You know, I, some of my senior colleagues, they would remember having to fly down to wherever and watch Surgeon X operate and you know, he or she would have to show them how to do it. I mean, we don't do that anymore, right? I mean, everything is available online. And so to be able to integrate that, even in the comfort of your own home, um, uh, you know, through the app, uh, I think is really exciting to really decrease the, the the slope of that learning curve for our trainees so they can get past that safety learning curve much quicker um, is really exciting. I love that. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Professor Patel, any thoughts? I think in terms of uh, technology, we can really get blown away, but that all focuses on um, your technical skill acquisition and improving your uh, performance. Um, in terms of technology making a big impact, I see sort of uh, data analytics and uh, predictive modeling from machine learning to identify trends, predict outcome, optimizing surgical protocol, uh, we will make um, surgery and surgeons more efficient and effective and improve patient care. Uh, in terms of obstacles and problems, uh, what I see that as, um, uh, you know, globally, we talk about, again, globalization and democratization of surgical education. 
but we are unable to achieve this uh, at a global scale like aviation where you have uniform international standards for training and performance assessment and everything. Mm -hmm. Why can't we have that in uh, surgery? Uh, you know, there's lack of integration of uh, technology and technology enhanced education into uh, your daily routine training curriculum, uh, etc. cetera. Um, if you ask me what one thing one change that I would like to see in surgery, the biggest change I'd like to see in surgery would be changing the surgical culture. And uh, where technology would step in would be having a collaborative surgical platform like DS1, you know, a digital platform that will facilitate collaboration among surgical surgeons teams, regardless of the geographic location, and can enhance uh, knowledge sharing and uh, uh, expert uh, utilization. So I think that, that and if you look at across different industry, you know, success comes from uh, people, uh, team working and changing the culture. It's a good and the soft non-technical skill, which account for 75% of success in most industry. But the technical skill contribute much less compared to the non-technical skills. So I would like to see technology address that and have more collaborative surgical platform that would uh, uh, bridge this gap between uh, cognitive skill and uh, uh, technical skill. That's a phenomenal answer. Thank you. And and you said something about changing culture. Um, before we we take some questions from the audience, uh, one last question for me is, you know, what has to happen to make touch surgery, whether it's our touch surgery free app or touch surgery enterprise, part of everyday usage um, in medicine and in surgical training? You know, what would need to happen from your standpoint? Professor Patel, you mentioned a change in culture. Is there, there are other things yeah, that we I think uh, we, we still rely on uh, classroom learning and textbooks and lectures. And if you look at uh, the, that is the worst form of learning experience where you sleep. You know, I fall asleep in lectures in classroom and I'm sure most of uh, the audience uh, as well. But that's not the right way to learn. We want immersive education. Touch surgery offers immersive education. DS offers, uh, you know, reviewing your performance. The best, you know, you, you can improve if you see. If you don't see, you'll never improve. So, you know, looking at your video, your own video, collecting your own performance video and analyzing it and interpreting that, that is priceless. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Lee? Yeah, no, I, I have very little to add to that. I think that's what uh, Professor Patel hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think one small barrier that, um, you know, in some jurisdictions uh, are, is more of a problem than others is is the whole data privacy and patient uh, privacy issue about video recordings. There's some surgeons that don't want their performance recorded, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, we've seen that with this platform and other platforms as well that have similar kind of goals. And I think that kind of culture, ultimately for me, you know, I, I, I know I'm not doing something heinous. Uh, I'm not trying to hide anything. I, I, I want to improve. So I, that's why I record all my cases. And there is some, there's some issues with, you know, litigation uh, concerns and things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, I think if you, we want to get better as surgeons, improve our culture and improve our technical skills, all of it, I think, uh, we need to accept that this is the you know next best way forward, and um, you know put those fears aside and, and ultimately move towards improving uh, patient care and patient outcomes. Amazing, thank you both. So we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so let me go through, and Kristen has curated some questions from the audience. So the first one here, and this is for both Professor Patel and Dr. Lee, what do you think is the most valuable data that can be extracted from surgical video? Dr. Lee, do you want to go first because you've got more experience in this? Sure. I, I think, um, you know, ultimately, um, it depends on who the audience is. I think when you're early trainee, you're getting a lot more um educational value by reviewing the, the uh, videos. You know, um, some of the high level feedback that I give some of the more senior trainees, I don't give to the juniors because they're just not at that level. They don't comprehend all the little nuances 
because uh, they don't even know how to how what the steps or the procedure are. So I think it's it really targeted depending on who your audience is. But ultimately, I think um, one thing that we're excited to do uh, at our hospital is to start to correlate, you know, surgeon performance, some of the other data that is coming out of these videos, and correlating it with patient outcomes, such that we can have a an algorithm down the road that, you know, helps guide us on improving post-operative continence rates, decreasing margin rates, and correlating actual technical approach and performance, um, and maybe looking at cert, um, patient demographics and how to best select certain approaches and, and things like that. So, correlating not just the just not just scoring the performance itself, but correlating those scores and those that data to actual patient outcomes. I think that is you know the the key, and so and that's the next step. We uh, there's not too many uh, folks that have really taken it to that level yet, so it's it's really exciting to to be part of that journey. I think what I would add to that is uh, uh, as a first step, looking at just the soft data rather than the hard data, you know, instrument movement, economy of movement, path length, identification of structures, the soft data is simply reflecting on your performance, which is what Dr. Lee said, you know, record your video, sit back and watch and see what went well and, you know, you know just critique that. And use your own video and somebody, your colleague's video, to sort of, you know, peer-to-peer -peer learning, feedback, and all that. That would be the first step on this journey. We don't use video then uh, recorded performance for just learning as much as, uh, you know, some other industry like uh, sports and athletes and all that. I think we need to just sort of really accept and embed that into our training and culture. Nice, very nice. Um, Dr. Lee, we have another question for you. Um, do you have any tips for working with administrators at your hospital to acquire solutions like Tut Surgery Enterprise? Well, I mean, I, th I think obviously it depends on which healthcare system you're in. In Canada, we're part of a sort of universal single payer healthcare system. So uh, the economics of it may differ than somewhere where they've got a hybrid model or if it's a hospital system that's uh, privatized, things like that. So obviously that, that you need to take that into consideration. But I think, you know, ultimately, if the hospital administration is focused on improving patient care, this is a no-brainer. We have data to support that. But, you know, sometimes it's not just about improving patient care. It's about cost effectiveness, et cetera. So I, I didn't, I think I alluded to it earlier. I think there's also some administrative data on patient flow, uh, operating room resource utilization, things like that, that can really improve, you know, from a hospital admin perspective, you know, uh, improve the use of our resources in an efficient, effective manner. So I think there are, there are some data points that can come out of uh, plat platforms like TSC that can be used for multiple purposes, right? Um, surgeon improvement, education, but administrative staff as well. Um, and, you know, not to get too much in the weeds, but, you know, we often have, you know, administrators tell us, hey, uh, Jason, you can't book those three cases, you're going to go over time. And, 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 you know, this we have, we will have surgeon specific data on the type of case, okay, you've booked a, you know, 56 year old male for this kind of pace. Well, based on all this data, that case would likely take you X amount of time. I can book three cases, you know, this is, we're not going to go over time. They can, you know, um, help uh, schedule human resource appropriately and that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot of, you know, in, um, important uh, outcomes from this data. I just, it's just a matter of collecting it, analyzing it properly and and, and looking at uh, effective uses for it. And, um, uh, you know, this is why people like Google are, are worth such, you know, so much money. They have so much data on everyone and utilizing that data to optimize, you know, us moving forward, I think is key. So this is really exciting. And there's, and there's two follow-ups to that particular question. Um, did you encounter any concerns about adopting a cloud-based solution in your hospital or did you have one already existing? Um, we have uh, internal um, storage for surgical videos, patient care um, related um, data, but uh, for the cloud, uh, for especially working with an outside company like Medtronic, there were some initial concerns um, the big thing was that it was basically all redacted data, right? There, there's no information about a patient name or date of birth going out onto the cloud. It's intraoperative video. I mean, if you can recognize who someone is by their guts and 
the way their bowel looks. I mean, great, good for you. I mean, uh, that would be unbelievable. Um, so, so there were some initial concerns, and obviously there are some concerns when we want to start to correlate some, uh, you know, data that that TSC is providing with patient outcomes because we do need to link the two. Uh, but we've been doing a lot of that in house, and so the the hospital, you know, uh, data privacy. Uh, folks were, weren't that concerned uh, based on the analytics that we're providing and providing in house. And you know, down the road, I think there'll be a little less uh, concern about some of this kind of thing as we all move towards uh, adopting, you know, uh, you know, recording uh, intraoperative um, footage. But also, you know, there's a lot of platforms that can record um, communication in the OR. And as as Professor Patel mentioned, I think some of the those kind of non-technical skills are just as important. Um, there is data to suggest surgical teams that communicate well have better outcomes than those that don't. So I think uh, all that kind of stuff will be important moving down the road. Okay, that's that's great to hear. Um, so I am mindful of time because um, this has been a, a absolutely fantastic discussion. I really want to thank the panelists for their time and their consideration and thoughtfulness in their responses. And I also want to thank all of you for engaging and, and uh, feeding in the questions. Um, so thank you all very much. Uh, wishing you all a fantastic day and, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Audrey, for having us. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.